Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Complacency Kills, a contact podcast. Uh, we're actually on episode 29 now, and we have a first-time guest here uh, today on this podcast, which will be uh, kind of talking about ballistic glass, uh, some of the uses, applications, the differences in them, the performance capability, uh, all that kind of fun stuff. So without further ado, uh, we have Brandon Witt here. So Brandon, yep. say hi and give a quick, uh, quick introduction on uh, who you are, where you came from. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So my name is Brandon Witt. I uh, joined the contact team about two months ago. Um, came over from a company by the name of Darley, who does a lot of distribution in the DOD, uh, military and federal government space. Um, so managed a few markets over there. Uh, jo- like I said, joined the team about two months ago and currently manage our Department of Defense and federal markets from a sales and business development perspective. Okay, cool. Um, and for anyone that's wondering, yes, we, we are brothers. You can go ahead and vote in our comment section who's better looking. We have a, a constant back and forth. Um, so, yeah, be sure to do that. But anyways, um, yeah, so we just wrapped up uh, a pretty fun shoot on some ballistic glass levels. Um, just kind of off the cusp, of, I think, was this your first uh, live ballistic glass shoot you've been to? Yeah, it was. Yep. Okay, cool. So what were your first initial impressions just on – the actual capability of the three different levels we tested, uh, what what parts of the test also stood out to you, uh, you know, in, in terms of performance between the three pieces? Yes, I think the thing that stood out to me the most, again, first, like, real ballistic test for me was the fact that depending on the, you know, various types of glass that uh, we tested, it was able to withstand not only one round for X amount of shots, but leading up to that, you know, 9mm, 45 uh, 5.56, five, et cetera, is able to withstand all of those and then some of, you know, 308 or whatever we were testing for that specific piece of glass. But it was very impressive. It was able to withstand all of those prior. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's one of the things, and we can get into it a little bit, um, but, you know, one of the things I think we should start off with for the for the person that's in the market, like, you know, that's searching for ballistic glass solutions, whether it's for a structure, um, an armored vehicle, anything like that, um, and again, that kind of, it, it, it spreads a lot of different industries. Most people think ballistic glass and they think military applications, particularly combat specific applications. Um, but in all the markets that we work with, um, you know, we see it, it gets deployed in schools, it gets deployed in hospitals, banks, um, you know, uh, I mean, for us, a big a big place that we uh, play in is obviously the commercial nuclear reactor security space as well as the DOE security space, um, which all have different requirements for pl- protecting against uh, forced entry and ballistic threats. Um, so that's one of the first things that uh, that you know we kind of want to get out there is that uh, there's actually a lot larger market place for it than than the average consumer would think, um, but. So we ran the first test, and I'll start off with this. We ran three tests. We ran one. Um, we essentially did a light, medium, and heavy is the simplest yep. way to describe it for the ballistic glass. Um, so our first test was on the UL4 uh, standard. Um, and so to be clear for everyone, um, you can go online, and you can see the UL752 ballistic rating charts, as well as the NIJ, the Nas- National Institute of Justice uh, ballistic rating charts. They're two separate standards that are followed. Uh, typically in America for ballistics. Um, and so the first one we did was uh, UL752 level four, which is uh, lab tested for a single shot of 30 out six ball ammunition. Um, and if I recall correctly, around 2,700 feet per second, right around there, um, which is all great and fine, right? We have to have some kind of standard that we follow. Um, but with that being said, you know, Brandon, you know, if you can go back through and walk through, Thing is, in the real world, you may be selecting this piece of glass. You specify it for whatever reason, um, but in realistic real-world threats, um, you know you're going to come across a, a variety of far more you know common calibers. Especially, you know, thirty out six is traditionally a hunting round, right? Um, so, can you talk a bit about what you saw in the UL four test? Yeah, so initially we struck it with the crowbar, which is something that you might see in something like a storefront um, and maybe an urban area or something like that. Uh, really no issues there. Um, that immediately got followed up by the 9 millimeter, five shots of that, which it withstood pretty well. A um, little bit of spalling, little, a few little divots, uh, but it really held up quite well. Um, followed that up by, it was five rounds of 45 ACP. Um, which it still held um, despite all the crowbar shots, uh, the 9 millimeter hits before. Uh, and then we went over to the uh, 762 shot out by the AK. And it withstood maybe the first, uh, the first or second round, um, but it, it did fail at that point. Uh, yeah. 
But it, like I said to my earlier point, it was quite impressive that even for for glass of, of that caliber, um, it was able to withstand those prior shots. Yeah, because essentially, like the UL four is kind of like your entry level into yep. rifle rated glass. Um, so obviously, the benefits of it: it's thinner, it's lighter, um, and obviously the the cost um, of the actual glass itself is is you know decently cheaper. Then once you get into the higher... It's accessible for a yeah, lot of people. Yeah, higher, more capable pieces of glass. Um, and again, it's very, very important for, especially uh, for those that are out there and they're reading stuff online like, oh yeah, I want level four glass. Well, the next test we did is also known as level four glass, but it's level four in the NIJ standard. Um, and in the NIJ standard, it's lab tested for a single shot of um, 30-06 AP, right? Um, so with that being said... Um, the thickness on the NIJ4 level glass is almost double that of what you see on the UL4 oh. pane. Um, and so in terms of the ability to um, ha- have multi-hit capability, whether it's from pistol or, uh, or uh, rifle small arms, is significantly higher than the UL4 standard. The one thing I'll point out is when I conducted that UL4 crowbar test, I was actually a little shocked how much damage was inflicted from the crowbar once I compared it to the yep. NIJ uh, level four one bees the nij level four it put small aesthetic divots on the exterior glass pane but really didn't have mm-hmm. any impact as opposed to the ul4 where uh, you could see cracking going all the way back through the yep. spall shield uh just from the crowbar um, so just from a force entry perspective they're they're night and day um yeah and on the the nij4 it really performed how i would have expected it to on the multi-hit um you know just from all the shooting we've done on other panes in, in you know in the past um, this particular set um, was actually a little short from what I thought it would uh, actually do on the multi-hit for the 308. So again, as a, as a refresh, if you watch the video, um, you know we went through the whole sequence that Brandon mentioned. We went through the the crowbar, the the nine mil, the 45, the AK. It stopped all of that, no problem. You know, so we're we're at 15 rounds on target at that point. Plus, um, oh, and I, we completely uh, passed on. We also hit it with five rounds of 5.56. Five, yep. um, so now we're at 20 rounds on target plus four crowbar strikes and no penetration. Um, I was expecting it to make through the five-shot test of the 308. Um, it failed on the last couple of shots. We had some penetrations uh, at the end. But again, overall, from a realistic perspective, on a small footprint, you know, call it a 12-inch by 12-inch footprint, and having, you know, 20 rounds uh, plus a few from the 308, so call it 23-ish, 24 rounds, um, it's still really really impressive because again you're comparing that to a lab test that just tells you it will withstand a single shot of 30 at 6 ap yeah and for my first ballistic test you know in person it was it was a stark contrast um those two and you know like you kind of mentioned before we're approaching this test from kind of a real world situation um as opposed to like a lab type of test Um, so it was really interesting to see the difference between those two yeah no absolutely the uh i think um you know, one of the things when we're working with customers, especially if you're going into like a kind of like a greenfield construction type scenario where you can start from scratch, um, if you have the ability and resources to go higher, obviously it's always better. Um, but one of the key things you have to do is look at your threat landscape and, and, and um, you know, work with, uh, you know, local law enforcement um, and other experts in your area that can actually understand the threat landscape of your surrounding area. What's, you know, what are crimes most, com- you know, committed by? Um, what are they typically seeing out on the streets? Um, so you kind of have to base your decision making based off of what's the most likely and realistic threat. Obviously, everyone would love to have the thickest, most capable UL 10 glass, but that's obviously not feasible uh, in every application. Um, so you just have to understand what your threat is and what the best option is in the you know ballistic glass or armor space in general on on what you want to defend against. Yeah. Um, but it's it's key to make the right decision um, on the front end because going back um, and learning the hard way uh, when someone actually does break into your facility or does shoot through your window, um, you really don't want to have to come to that. So um, please, yeah, uh, that's the thing I can say is do your research and talk to talk to experts that have gone out and not only been around the lab testing but also done a bunch of uh what we'll call street testing kind of like we did here today yeah absolutely so um the the big behemoth though in the room was the uh was the 50 cal glass that we did at the end ul 752 level 10 glass um which is you know about like that thick um and weighs you know (laughs) it was heavy what feels like you know 80 pounds a square foot i can't remember the spec off the top of my head but it's 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 pretty heavy yeah um so with all that being said, I mean, we put it through the ringer. Yeah. Uh, um, 
I think the actual, the first true penetration we had on target on the head was from a 50 cal DE. Yeah. Um, but that was after, to be clear, that was all done after we, again, watched the video. We did the entire battery of tests. Um, and then once we got beyond the five shots of 308, we put an additional 20 rounds to failure. It did not fail. No. Um, and then we did another battery of 20 rounds, which, again, we're going to go back and check out the video. Um, but it probably had another five to ten additional rounds on yeah. top of it. I don't it think it failed till probably 30 or 31 about. Yeah. Uh, it was impressive. Yeah. And it's on a small footprint, right? We're talking 12 inch by 12 inch. Um, and uh, what was also interesting, and w w we see how the glass reacts. Because if you watch the video, we had different size panes of actual glass affixed in there. Um, but we're all shooting again for around a 12 inch by 12 inch uh, mass. But you can see as your window structure actually grows, the failure we had on the um, on the NIJ4 glass, which is our largest pane, um, that just it took the whole spall shield and just grabbed it and, and ripped it out. Which the implications that has is for follow on shots that are anywhere in that shop group where the spall shield's gone, you're pretty much getting guaranteed penetrations every time. Um, so. When it comes to your window construction, how how large of uh, panes you actually want in your facility, that's also a big consideration too. Yep. So, yep. kind of food for thought uh, on that front. Um, so, on the DoD side, um, what what are the major applications that you personally deal with when it comes to when it comes to working with ballistic glass? Yeah, so I'd say primarily on the DOD side, what I see most often would be for large projects, for example, if we're talking like gate entries, um, oftentimes, uh, whether it be an Air Force base, Army base, whatever, they might be redoing the gate entrance. And so along with that project, they're going to be putting in a gatehouse, uh, they're going to be putting in guard booths, fencing and stuff like that. Um, so that's somewhere where we, we see that a lot. And that's where our team can come out um, along with myself and an engineer to come out there and, and talk, kind of talk you through if, if there's not a current you know, spec that you have in mind, we can walk you through what it might look like. Um, and yeah, that, that's what we see most often uh, in terms of common projects. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 you know, again, completely different markets, but very similar approach. Uh, we have uh, salesmen uh, such as Branson, who deals a lot with the commercial sector, uh, as you know, uh, education, uh, religious venues, anything like that. Um, but again, it's all the same common thread is that, um, you know, Unfortunately, in this day and age, uh, we, we've gotten to a point where we have to actually take active measures um, to prevent against particular threats that are out there. Um, and so it's kind of a it's kind of a catch all now to where almost everyone's doing it. Um, yeah. We get inquiries all the time for people's home residences as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, an important distinction I want to make for uh, anyone that's listening to us right now is that um, if you're in the market, also do your research and uh, something that you'll commonly see is security film or they'll call it a lot of times they'll use the nomenclature of ballistic film, um, which is very misleading. Um, so what that is, is honestly uh, the best way to describe it for listeners. It's a uh, thin layer of glass and polycarbonate, very, very thin. Um, and so uh, they range anywhere from, you know, five mil to 15 mil, which is pretty typical. And that's, you know, thousands of an inch thick. So yep. like 15 thousands of an inch thick. It's a film that goes on. Um, what that is intended to do is primarily for forced entry, yep. right? So um, it uh, it's going to keep all of the tempered glass in between the layer, uh, the uh, security film. If you have it on the exterior and interior, it's going to keep it all intact, um, and and per, you know, so it, it treats the window as one giant unit and allows it to flex, but it keeps all the glass yep. together. Um, and in a ballistic event, it's not going to stop a. a Pistol, rifle, really doesn't matter. It's not stopping it. Really, the only added benefit um, in a ballistic scenario is that, like I said, it'll keep all of the glass together. So you'll have a penetration. It'll be a clean penetration, and so your whole window is not going to be shot out yeah. and collapse, um, but uh, it is not ballistic rated. So when you see the ballistic film, you know, if your intent is to actually stop uh, ammunition, just stay away from it. Yeah. Um, you but know, if, we're, if we're talking things like storefronts, really, the idea is delayed entry. Right. That's the whole goal. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, to your point, yeah, for commercial applications, yeah. force entry is typically their main threat. Um, so that's what they'll defend against. Yeah. Um, but with all that said, um, on the ballistic glass front, what kind of uh, what kind of questions or anything do you have for me, Brandon, uh, based off of what you saw today? Because I know this is kind of a new experience for you. Yeah, I, I think... Uh better understanding when you're buying a piece of glass the different components and layers that go into it could be helpful in terms of making the right decision for what your needs are um so yeah better understanding is obviously obviously different types of materials that go into various levels of glass so 
um, better understanding that I think would be super helpful, not only for me, but for, you know, any customer as well. Yeah, no, for sure. And also, um, so you can look it up, the State Department, they have their own uh, um, SPAL level protection for ballistic and blast. Right. So also when you're working with a glass manufacturer, you, you know, people also don't always know to delineate. Do I want no spall effect? Right. Um, or, you know, medium spall, right. high spall. And that all uh, has implication on the actual layer layup of the glass. Um, what kind of spall shield goes into it? How thick is it? Um, and really the effect of that, right, is that it's still stopping the round in like a, in like a low spall scenario. What we're saying is that it can still stop the round. You're not getting penetration, right. but you can't expect fragmentate glass you know very very small particulate to actually come off the glass right and still get a stop um and no spall scenario would be there's no spall there's no fragmentation coming off from the interior piece of the glass so that's also something again when you're speaking with a manufacturer be sure to uh to address those uh those uh you know components of the glass and make sure you know you know what you're actually getting um but yeah, with, again, um, at Contech, we do a lot of work with ballistic glass, everything from target hardening of facilities to uh, guard booths and ballistic rated enclosures and all that kind of fun stuff. So we work with it very frequently. Um, again, I, I think it was a great opportunity for us to get out and actually do some street testing because, again, we read and see the lab reports all the time um, of what they're testing to that standard. But it's good to get out in the real world and actually oh, yeah. see what it can truly handle. Yeah. So, uh, Brandon, thanks for coming on. It was good to have you on. Uh, we'll have you on for a lot more. Um, and if you have any questions, be sure to reach out to us at info at contactindustries.com. Uh, follow us on uh, YouTube and Instagram and LinkedIn. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll find some more good content from us in the future. Absolutely. All right, man. Yep. Take care. Thanks.